Greetings. In the name of our Lord and Savior, I welcome you to St. Andrew's United Methodist Church, Virginia Beach. I'm Pastor Witt. Hope you've had a wonderful week. Boy, we're in the midst of summer now, aren't we? It's hard to believe that the sun has already reached its peak for us, and now we're moving back away from it uh, as the northern hemisphere. Um, temperatures will continue to rise. I really enjoy the, the heat during the summer for a very short period of time, then I'm ready for it to move on. So, uh, anyway, again, I hope you're well. I hope you're taking care of yourself. Um, I would say to you that, that COVID is still out there. Please be safe. Wash your hands. You know, the, many of the things that they've told us about COVID are simply just good things for us to do on a regular basis to, to keep ourselves safe anyway. So, so be it. We'll take it. To all you who helped with Troopsters, gave money and uh, and items, and those that came to set up on Friday and then came and packaged last Sunday, thank you very much. For those of you that are working with the garden, quite a few folks, thank you. Thank you very much for your for your love and your care of God and um, of that ministry. For those that are. Uh, taking stuff over to St. Andrews and bringing things for that. Thank you for those that uh, are contributing funds to the ministries of St. Andrews and also the, the subordinate ministries that we have to that. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like for you this week to pray for all of the pastors who moved this past year. Uh, that would be this week. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm taping today and so this will be the day that uh, men and women across the Virginia Conference are taking new appointments, including our new district superintendent. And so we, we welcome her. I think that's about all I have. I would encourage you to uh, continue to make offerings to the ministry of the church. And if you're not doing so, I would encourage you to do so. And if you're sending money elsewhere, I would ask you to consider uh, where you're sending it and think about uh, sending it to the church, that the church may um, have the lion's share of your benevolent gifts to, to help folks. Um, as we attach our name to these funds, that of followers of Jesus Christ, it helps us to move the cause forward. All right, um, interesting story, probably one that you've heard many times we're gonna talk about today. Naaman and uh, King Aram and uh, Elijah, so uh, Elisha. So anyway, how about we get started with our worship by taking a couple moments to center ourselves on Christ. Won't we pray? Let us pray.
Please join me in the call to worship. God calls us to worship today. We are here. All are invited, the sick, the well, the believer, and the doubter. We are here. Wash us, O God. May we be cleansed by your holy love. We are here. Amen. Now hear the centering prayer. God of liberation, we are gathered to meet with you this morning. Open our hearts to the many ways you will speak to us. As you did with the prophets, you call us out of our everyday lives to share your message of love and grace. Challenge us today to look within ourselves so that we may be your disciples. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, open to us your written word. Holy Spirit, attach to these words and make them become living words and living experiences for us. Amen. This morning's first scripture reading comes from 2 Kings, chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from a skin disease. Now the Arameans on one of their raids had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his skin disease. So Naaman went and told his lord just what the girl of the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Go then, I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his skin disease? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard what the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me, he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the skin disease. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, wash and be clean? So he went down to and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan. According to the word of the man of God, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy and was clean. Our second scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 1 through 11 and 16 through 20. After this, the Lord appointed seventy-two others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. 
He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, Even the dust that clings to our feet we wipe off in protest against you. Yet, know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The seventy-two returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name even demons submitted to us. And he said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. Indeed, I have given you authority to dread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The written word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Good morning. This summer, we're going to spend some time learning from people called prophets. Now, some of you already know that a prophet was someone who had received a message from God and then told that message to other people. The prophets will teach us how to hear a message and then tell that message to others. Today's story is found in the Old Testament in the book of 2 Kings, and it involves an army commander named Nahum, who had a very, very important job in the king's army, but he also had a very nasty skin disease, and he needed to find a cure. One night, Nahum's wife suggested that he see a prophet named Elisha. She thought Elisha could help heal his skin. Naaman went, Naaman went to Elisha's house, but Elisha didn't even come out to meet him. He just sent word for Nathan to Nahum to wash seven times in the River Jordan. Nahum was frustrated. Couldn't he just wash in, his, in the river near his own home? But one of his men convinced him to just try. And Nahum arrived at the Jordan River, got out of his chariot, and walked into the muddy water. He bent down and went under the water. And he did it again. That's twice. Now count them with me. He did it again. And again. And again. He did it another time. And another time. When he came out of the water, he was fully expected to still see the exact same disease that he had when he went in the water. He expected to look just as bad as he had before. When his men didn't say anything, he looked at his arms and the skin looked clean and fresh. And he felt his face and his nose was smooth and soft. Nahum had been healed. God had healed him. And all Nahum had to do was to wash seven times in the Jordan River. Nahum knew for certain that no one was more powerful than God, and that God could cure what seemed to be incurable. Nahum was healed by being obedient to God. God may want you to do something simple for him. Be obedient and do what God wants. Let us pray. God of communication, there is no one more powerful than you. Thank you for the story of Nahum and his obedience to you. This week, let us be like Prophet Nahum, as we are reminded that even the small things in life can do big things for you. Amen. The title of today's uh, thoughts uh, is Wash and Be Cleansed. Wash and Be Cleansed. I was thinking this past week about powerful people with some of the stories that I'm seeing on TV and and some of the, the books that I've read and some of the people that I've talked with. Isn't it interesting that the more powerful that we are, the less we like to be told to do things. Um, what is it about being told to do something that just strikes a chord with the human spirit to say no? I have yet to meet a child who, 
who moves through what we call the terrible twos. The only reason they're terrible is because the child finally takes on a, a persona big enough for his, him or herself to be able to stand up to other people and start saying no over and over. It's funny, you know, <laughs> my dog this morning as I left the house, he shot through the gate. He ran around the little side thing there between the fence and the uh, and the road, round and round in circles. I called him three or four times, and he had that look in his eyes which said, no. And I just started laughing. I said, get your behind back in here. And then he turns, and he comes on in. Um, I wonder. I wonder what it is about us. Today we're going to take a look at the human condition um, that seems to be most prevalent above all others, as far as I can see. This proclivity that we have for, uh, well, <laughs> I had a buddy. Um, he's now gone to be with the Lord. But he used to say as of, of his wife that, that she had a, um, a Burger King syndrome. She wanted everything her way. And that just cracked me up, and it still sticks with me 15 years later. I think humans are that way. And when Burger King came up with that as a slogan, you know, have it your way, I think it resonated with the core belief system uh, or the makeup of folks that, that we want things our way. We want to do them our way. Um, even as we approach God, we approach God with the understanding that we're approaching our way. Um, I think the main thing that God has had to fight against, has had to work with, over the um, over the years with humanity, is this thought process that humanity wants to define who and what God is, and who and what humanity is, and who and what the relationship is. Um, you know, we don't mind listening to God as long as we can listen to God our way. I wonder what life would be like if we could actually listen to God and and hear what it is that, that God has for us um, and take on the likeness of the nature and the activity of, of life that God says would bring us fulfillment. I, I've wondered what that is. You know, in the garden, God said, listen, you can have everything in here except for this one tree. All of it, it's all yours, except for this one tree. And this one little teeny thing, this is, and yet humanity had to have it. Um, and began the problem that we have all the way down today. Um, <laughs> from the mountain, God said, listen, these are ten words of wisdom that I have for you. They'll make you individually and corporately have great lives. All you got to do is follow them. And, uh... <laughs> You know, what if we listened and followed those? But instead, you know, we perused them, uh, looking for loopholes. I remember when I was a kid, uh, I read something about W.C. Fields, said that he was in a, um, in a room where he was getting ready to go on, and he started reading a Bible, and one of the folks came in, I don't know who it was, I don't remember, but they looked at him and said, what are you doing? You don't believe in that book at all, let alone what's inside it. And W.C. said, just looking for loopholes. Humanity. We're constantly looking for loopholes in the direction of God. Um, that which was very simple suddenly became extremely complicated. That which were very few suddenly became hundreds of rules and regulations trying to parse it out. You know, from God through the teachings of Jesus Christ, they asked him one day, they said, tell us what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, oh, that's simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and all your spirit and all your being. The Shema. And love your neighbor as yourself. And humanity said, you know, God wants an awful lot. And who is neighbor? And God said, well, you know, neighbor is not clan. 
neighbors more than clan. Neighbor is those you live with all around you, all near, all that you pass by. Jesus began to tell stories about who neighbor was. It's interesting to me that, that Jesus boiled this thing down to two very simple things, to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and neighbor is self. Of course, that's what the Ten Commandments does. You know, if you look at the ten and then you take a look at Jesus A and B, the A and B are the ten. How simple life would be if we simply would, you know, have no other gods before God. Dun, dun, dun. Keep the Sabbath holy. You know, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt, you know, these, thou shalt not commit adultery. These kind of things. But then what do we want to do? We want to parse these out. What does it really mean to lie? What does it really mean to kill? What does it really mean to commit adultery? Um, huh. And we end up saying, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I can trust these two things, Jesus, or I'm not sure that I heard you correctly, or I'm not sure that I understand it fully. You know, the story that we have today is a story of speaking uh, truth to power. You know, the girl spoke. The girl who is, you know, I'm not going to talk about this much here, but if you make it to, to church on Sunday and come to Sunday school class, I'm going to discuss some more. We're going to begin to to parse this thing down tighter as to who this girl is and where she comes from. She's from Israel, one of the northern tribes. Um... She has very little power. She's a woman. She's a girl. She's been captive and taken into this new people. Um, she's a hand servant. And um, she speaks, she speaks courage of truth to power. You know, this guy has some type of a skin disease. Don't know what it is. Have no idea. Wouldn't presume to try to figure it out. Whatever this is, it's so problematic that everyone knows about it. And she says, you know, if only you could get over to my people where you took me from and go and see the holy man over there, you'd be healed. He'd be healed. I think about, you know, her powerless state that she's in. This is really, really risky for her to say such a thing. Just to say it was risky let alone for, for him to possibly try and do something about this. And as the story says, it, the, this, this, this comment makes its way to the top guy. And the top guy says, you know, I love this man enough. Take a letter from me and send it over there to that king and have him healed. Well, that's interesting. And, and, you know, along with that silver and gold and clothes and all these things are sent along with it. Now, the king over there becomes frightened and agitated because this guy has sent over one of his, one of his generals, one of his top people to come and get healed. He's scared. He's frightened. It was reminiscent uh, uh, for me of the time when the, when the uh, Magi showed up. And the king uh, down in Judah uh, was frightened. And it says, and all of Jerusalem was frightened with him. Um, this, you know, this could have been a conflict that was getting ready to go. It was a, a powder keg. You know, along with the girl, if you go back and look at Jesus, Jesus spoke truth to power. He spoke to the power of the world. He spoke to the power of the religious community. He spoke to the power of society, of these societal norms of separation. And in fact, as I said last week and the week before, he employs this stirring of the people. Jesus is one who comes into the world and in his power, it's interesting, he's the most powerful thing that ever walked on the earth. And yet seemingly he's powerless. And in his powerlessness, he speaks truth. To the power structures of this world. And if only they would turn and start listening to him, then things would be vastly different. God's word doesn't always come to us through power structures. 
Naaman was looking for a source of uh, power to get things straightened out, and it didn't happen. The story is about having the courage to hear truth from places that may not seem to be able to carry truth, because in the reality of humanity, those that have power, they also speak more truth. I don't believe that, and I think if anything's happened in the past 10 or 15 years, we certainly have come to a conclusion that may not be true anymore, but there is this underlying understanding that those that are in charge do seem to have truth in their hand. But this story is about having the courage to hear truth from the midst of places that may be powerless. The king listens to the hope found in a servant girl who has been taken from another country. Naaman traveled to a hostile territory to try and get healed. Naaman's servant told him to, to follow the direction of the holy man. You know, this could have gotten this servant killed, these servants who, who looked at Naaman and said, you know, you're getting all uptight about this. Come on, let's go do what he said could have very easily gotten them killed. But they end up being powerless people with truth again on their lips. And he followed the ridiculous request of going down to this muddy river and washing himself in it seven times. But in doing so, he's healed. God asks the simplest things of us. He asks us to simply believe. He asks us to follow his teachings. God asks us to, to love God with all our heart and all our soul, our spirit, our mind, our strength. To love God with all of that. And to love neighbor as self. These things, they are paradynamic shifts from what the world calls for. I call them simple things and they probably are simple but the implications of them inside of our lives is huge. If by chance the church and its followers were able to do this, if by chance the world would pick up on this and begin to do it, what a different place it would be. Jesus redefines what neighbor is. He begins to say that it's those with whom you come in contact. He tells the story about the guy going to Jerusalem on the Jericho Road. He tells it of the religious guy, of the lawyer, and then of the Samaritan. And he says, you know, the Samaritan's the neighbor to the Jew. Huh. Jesus asks us to forgive those that hurt us, to do good to those that harm us. And I say that if we can follow the direction of Jesus, if we can follow the direction of God, if we can do the simple things, like washing ourselves in a dirty river, like simply laying down the hurt that's in our lives, laying down the pain that's in our lives, and, and laying it at the feet of Jesus and allowing God to take care of these things. And picking up hope, love, joy, peace. Pick these things up in a faith way to begin with and then live into them. I think we're healed. I think our lives become good. If we do it individually, yeah. If we could do it corporately, my God, we'd change the world, wouldn't we? Wow. Wash and be cleansed. Wash and be cleansed. Wash and be cleansed. May the God who loves you beyond your wildest imagination bring you these words. Increase your faith. Fill you with such grace that it pours out upon other people. May you be washed and cleansed. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, 
Let us confess our sins before God and before one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray silently for our sins. Hear the good news, the gospel. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let us pray silently now for the offerings, the tithes, the sacrifices, the offerings that have come in through the internet, through the mail, and those that have been delivered here. Let us pray. Join me in the prayer of dedication. Generous God, we give thanks for all that you have given us. We return from it an offering for the sake of spreading love as the body of Christ. Open us, Lord, to even better ways to steward your creation under our care. Help us to aid you and bring your kingdom to the world. In the name of Christ Jesus, we offer this prayer. Amen. Let me remind you that if you would like some of these for your home, just simply come by and pick a few up. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's right to give our thanks and praise. 
It's right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their ending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. The night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he raised it, blessed it, broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took a cup, a new cup, an additional cup. He raised it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, O oh Lord, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ, offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, O oh Lord, and on these gifts of bread and wine and those at home. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the whole world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church. Honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May this be a means of grace for us, O oh Lord, a, a place where we find the mystery of your presence. And may this be more than a cup of juice. May it be a sign and a symbol of your sacrifice, O oh Lord, and a call for ours. Amen. You may receive. Let us join in singing our closing hymn.
went to the world empowered by the Spirit of God and be people of God who are living into the mystery of doing the simple things that God calls us to do. Go and do so. Wash and be cleansed. Wash and be cleansed. Go and do so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Be blessed. Be a blessing. Amen.